Romans chapter 1, this is a very famous passage. It's, uh, I mean, world-renowned. This is a foundation of the Christian faith. You could call it Christianity 101. And there's some very deep topics in here, and I want to contrast two of these opposing topics. Uh, If you will, we want to juxtapose one versus the other. If you will, look at verse number 16, which is the most famous. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In verse 16, he tells us about the power of God. What is the power of God? Well, it's the gospel. How do we see God's power in our life? Well, it starts by believing the gospel and then walking by faith and preaching the gospel to others. So I want to take this first concept, the power of God, and then go two verses away. Go to verse number 18. Look what it says. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. I want to talk about the difference between the power of God and the wrath of God. Because God will pour out His wrath one day on this earth, and those that have the power of God through salvation by believing the Gospel, we know it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, that we are not appointed unto wrath. God's not going to pour out His wrath on His people. But when it talks about the power of God is in the Gospel of Christ by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, And then the opposite over here is the wrath of God, which He will pour out on people, uh, yes, at some point in the end times, yes, but also right now, every day as we go through this life. Now, look, as Christians, we are appointed to, he says in 1 Thessalonians 3, verses 3 and 4, it says that we are to suffer affliction and tribulation. We're, We're going to endure some things while we're on this earth. That's part of uh, what God's plan is for us, that our, through our suffering we can glorify Him. So I'm not saying that once you're saved, you're not going to have a bad time, but I want you to know, as with Job, when something happened to him that was devastating, that was not the wrath of God, that was the wrath of the devil. But now somebody else that was an uh, uh, anti-God, well, the wrath of God will be poured out on them in this life every day, and then eventually uh, there's more to come through hell and the second death. So I I want to look at these thoughts here in Romans 1, because Romans 1 is such a powerful chapter, and there's 32 verses, and it's pretty well split down the middle, talking about the gospel and the wrath of God. Look at verse number 1. He says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. So he was called to that particular office, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scripture. So uh, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ was already prophesied and promised. If you remember uh, Acts 10, 43, to him give all the prophets witness that whosoever believeth in his name shall receive remission of sin. So we're saved by trusting in that. The prophets knew it was coming. Verse 3, concerning his son... Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Now what, how it's happening here is he's identifying who we're talking about. Uh, if your Bible does not say Jesus Christ our Lord, then your Bible has been influenced by the Catholics. There's no other way to put it. Uh, this is the full autograph of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, Every other Bible deletes this. They omit this. They just wipe it out of the Scriptures. It says, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. So there were promises given to David of a king coming, and in the flesh, that is Jesus. Now, Jesus will come back as a reigning king one day, but he came in the form of a servant, we're told, initially. He fulfilled that prophecy because he was 100% flesh, He was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. He was spotless, and he took our sin, right? So verse 4 shifts. He goes from talking about Jesus in the flesh to Jesus being God. Verse 4, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience into the faith, among all nations. So he's, he's making this point. We have an office. We've got a calling. I'm reaching out to you. You have a calling as well. Uh, look at verse number 8. He speaks of faith yet again. First, 
I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the world. So who are we speaking to in Romans chapter 1? Well, this is written to those that lived in Rome. It doesn't matter their lineage. What mattered was their faith. We're saved by faith, and he's speaking to those that lived in that political nation. And he says, we heard that the gospel made it to Rome. He's going to go on and say, I hope to get to Rome and I want to be there with you and I want to impart a gift and I want to be part of the work that's going on there. But right now, we've heard all around the world, we heard that faith has made it to Rome. Now, this was good news. All roads lead to Rome. I mean, this was the hub. This was the capital. This is where everything was happening, which was great because if the gospel is going to spread to the world, when it goes to Rome, then it can spread out from there and go to every nation. So he says your faith is spoken of, not your works, not your conversion, your faith. It's all about what you believe. In fact, look at verse 12. He says, that is that I may be comforted together with you That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now, Paul is trying to bring this point of saying, Hey, Romans, I'm Paul. I was a Pharisee. You're a Roman, a Greek, or wherever you're from. And we have the mutual faith. We have the same faith. We're all saved by the same gospel. In fact, verse 14, he says, I am debtor. That means I'm indebted to do this. I'm debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. He's saying, I'm not a racist. It's not just for the Jews. It's not just for the Greeks. It's for the barbarians. It's not just for the wise people, the smart ones. It's for, the, it's for everybody, right? The gospel is simple. Keep it bottom shelf. It's for everybody. Paul was trying to make that very clear. Verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Here it is. The gospel of Christ. You know that all the other Bibles will take out that phrase of Christ. You understand there are over 5,000 copies of the Bible in the Textus Receptus or the majority text. This is why we're King James only. Uh, It's not that King James was anything special as a man, but God used him divinely to bring together all these men that were in opposition and and they made sure that the Scriptures won. That the majority, what we had that was passed down for thousands of years, we still hold in our hand And then the battle began to pervert the Scriptures. Shortly thereafter, 100, 200, 300 years, they began creating new Bibles where they say, I found an old copy in a trash heap that nobody was using. And you know what? They deleted the word Christ here. It just says, it was just the good news. No, it's the good news of Jesus Christ. It's the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every word matters, and that should not be removed from the Bible. He says, I am not ashamed of the Gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He's making it clear the promise that was to the, to the Jews was also to the Greeks. It was for the whole world. We're blessed by what Jesus did. There is no salvation any other way. There is no, uh, no one has a better way to salvation. There's one way, the Lord Jesus Christ, right? I am the way, the truth, the life, and no man cometh to the Father but by me. Without Jesus, you're going to end up in hell. It's very clear that's why that word christ is essential if i just told you hey do you believe the good news you'd say sure of what (laughs) but when you say do you believe the gospel of christ there were people oh you mean jesus you'll find that opposition suddenly people don't like that name they want to fight against that name and they don't believe in this doctrine now look at verse 17 as he ties it together for therein is the righteousness of god revealed from faith to faith as it is written the just shall live by faith you get eternal life by your faith when you as a christian having that faith in your heart and you go out and preach the gospel to somebody you share your faith i know that's not a bible term and uh, some people use it very lame i like the word soul winning or uh, evangelism or gospel preaching right but but it's an accurate statement according to this verse which from my faith to your faith when you receive it and believe it and trust in christ it's because somebody else preached it unto you but i want you to notice in this verse he says the righteousness of God revealed from 
faith. Now, hold your place here and go to Romans 10. Go to Romans chapter 10. And when you get there, look at Romans 10, 10. For with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. Ooh, now wait a minute. He tells us in Romans 3.10, there are none righteous, no, not one. You're not perfect, and you don't always do the right thing. You're a sinner, right? So Romans 3.10, he says, no one's righteous. Romans 10.10, he says, for with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. How do I become righteous before God? Well, you believe the gospel. So when you see in Romans 1, verse 17, when he says, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. When you believe the account of the gospel, God looks down and He says, you're righteous. That is salvation. Amen. This is so important. Uh, it's in, uh, the reason I think this is important, I want to I draw this parallel. The power of God versus the wrath of God. This chapter is split in half. When we step over into verse 18, it's going to get kind of dirty. It's going to get kind of ugly in the last 18 verses. This is a very important concept. I'd like to illustrate it very, very simply. I just want you to understand. Now, Brother Jake, in our Sunday school hour this morning, as he was giving a gospel presentation, he made a statement, and it's true, but I'm going to say something slightly different. Brother Jake made the statement. He said, there's two types of people in the world. Isn't that right? Right? So there's the saved let's make that little stick man all right then there's the lost we'll make this little stick man okay now this is true but what i want to add to it i want to show you is that there's two types of lost people so you can say there's three there's really only two i don't want to complicate it i want to simplify it there's this other person over here, and maybe, maybe you're an electrician. Here, here's one that makes sense to me. There's the positive, there's the neutral, and there's the negative, right? When you're saved, you're always saved. You have the Lord Jesus Christ living inside of you. When you're lost, you have an opportunity to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and get saved and have the Holy Spirit dwelling with you. But there's another category of person that the Bible's about to warn us about here. They're negative. There are three types of people in the world. The Bible uses this phrase. There are the, uh, well, John 1, 12, he says, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. We are children of the most high God, right? We're sons of God. We're called Christians. We're called disciples of Christ. What's another, what's another word? Somebody help me out believers amen what a great one. i'm a bible believer right uh give me another one are there any others saint. a saint Ooh, what a great word a saint that doesn't mean i am perfect it's mean it means his perfection was put on me right so that's the christian now the lost you could call them a sinner you could call them an unbeliever right what was it uh who was it that was talking to paul and he says almost thou persuadest me to be a christian agrippa, agrippa almost i mean you're convincing me you're being very convincing and i'm almost ready to come over here but nah not quite i'm going to stay right here right so he's lost in his sin in verse 18 he tells us about the wrath of god he says for the wrath of god is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness this is a special category of person it says they hold the truth in unrighteousness this isn't just somebody that's a little confused this is what we would call a false prophet if you remember in matthew chapter 23 he talked about the scribes the pharisees he called them hypocrites he called them vipers he talked about their converts he said they're twofold more the child of hell what i'm talking about over here you could call it a child of hell the old testament they called him a child of belial which is the devil these are the sons of the devil now uh, we know that 
a Christian cannot be possessed. Once you're saved, you're filled with the Holy Spirit. You're indwelled with the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, the devil can whisper in your ear. And he can tempt you. And you can give in and you can open the door and let him in your house. These in the middle that are lost, the Bible says that they are taken captive by Him at His will. The devil can possess a lost person and take over and take control. Now, when you're a son of the devil and you know who God is, and you're not just lost in unbelief, but you know what's right and wrong and you hate what's right and you love what's evil and you know who the devil is and you embrace the devil... There comes a point with God where you cross a line and you step over to this other category. You become a son of the devil. You become permanently possessed with a devil just as we are permanently filled with the Holy Spirit. We have God's indwelling inside of us. Now, whether or not we walk in the Spirit or the flesh, that's our daily choice, right? Over here, these folks, they know what they're doing. They hate God and they want to work against Him while they're alive. Now, this is a fascinating concept. I'll I'll skip ahead and come back. Uh, If you look in verse 28, it says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. This is a reprobate. This is the easiest word for it. It's a reprobate. They're a child of the devil. Now, once we're saved, we're always a son of God. If you're lost, there's a few terms the Bible would use. In Genesis chapter 5, it talked about the children of Adam, the sons of Adam. You're just in the flesh. Jesus used the phrase about the children of this world, and He contrasted it to the children of light. The children of light were obviously those that are saved. We have, because He is the light that lighteth every man that cometh in the world, right? So we have that true light. We're the children of light. Uh, The lost people, whichever one you might be, are called children of the world. You're just in the flesh. When you're born again, you always have the Holy Spirit. But there's a line here with God, with a lost person, and when they choose to reject God to a certain point, they choose to become a reprobate. Now, this is an important doctrine, and it's also a very dangerous doctrine. You ever heard the saying, if if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail? Okay? And so what happens, some Christians, they learn that there's a person over here that it's not that Jesus didn't die for their sins. Jesus paid for every sin they'll ever commit, no matter how wicked it is. But they will not receive the gift of God, which is eternal life. They hate God and they actively fight against Him while they're here. And they're opposed. They want to be part of the forces of darkness, if you will. But why? Because there's a war for souls. And that's our job, is to pull them out of the fire, Amen. as he says in Jude. We have to pull them out of the fire with the Gospel of Christ. That is the power of God. He gives us that power to pull them out by preaching the Gospel. Well, it's the same way. These guys over here, they're after the ones in the middle. And while they're at it, if they could cause you to stumble, you better believe they would. They'd love nothing more than to get a Christian to fail so they can put it on the news and say, see, I told you those Christians were that way. You might as well do whatever you want. Now, it's a dangerous doctrine if you, all, if you become a reprobate hunter. That guy cut me off in traffic. He's probably unsavable. You know, hey, careful, careful, all right? Their sins were paid for, but they will not believe. John 12 talks about that, that they could not believe. They, they stiffen their neck. They harden their heart. Pharaoh has another example. If you start reading through Exodus, it says Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. He said, that's what you want? I'll give it to you. It talks about it in Jude and in Peter that there are some that have seared their conscience. They don't want to feel bad when they do evil. They want to do evil and enjoy it. We would call a person like that a reprobate. There are other passages, both Old and New Testament, that teach this doctrine. And it's just a warning. Be careful, there are certain false prophets out there and they love to hurt the innocent. They love to hurt children and beguiling unstable souls, the Bible says. They want to get the ones that aren't, haven't really figured it out yet and they really want to hurt them. 
And they want to ruin them and pull them over to their side so eventually they'll be a recruiter for Satan instead of being saved important concept now i have to bring this out there are there is a calvinist version of this doctrine where they say god picked this person to go to hell and there's nothing they can do about it and god picked this person to go to heaven and there was nothing they didn't even get to choose to believe the gospel that's a lie that's a lie God gave us free will to choose to believe in Him, and yet He's so powerful, He is sovereignly able to stop a red light to protect your life. I believe that. I believe that. But God will not force your hand on salvation. He, will, he wants to give you every opportunity. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Everybody has heard the call. Everybody has an opportunity to go to the light. But men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. In the flesh, we're sinners. When we have faith, we become saved forever. Meanwhile, there's a war for the souls, and the enemy are the, those that work for the devil, the children of the devil. And so we'll call them reprobates. Let's look real quick in Romans 1. The wrath of God, verse 18, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So they know what the truth is, and they make it unrighteous. This is a false prophet, as Jesus talked about in Matthew 23. Verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. Again, I want to point out, you could say that the lost person is ignorant of God, we're talking about somebody that knows all about God and they want nothing to do with Him, right? Continue reading in verse 20. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Every person is without excuse. There is a Creator. It's revealed to them. They're especially without excuse. Verse 21. Because that when they knew God, so they see who He is, they hear of God. They glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. They want to darken their heart. They want to stiffen their neck. They want to sear their conscience. They don't want to hear from God. Now listen, I know that in our sinful state, even if I'm talking about you and me over here, there are times in our sin where we don't want to be reminded that we're sinning until we have that broken and contrite heart and we begin to repent and say, I'm sorry, Lord. Help me to get closer to You. Help me to get in Your Word to be fed in the Spirit. Right? There are times where we're such in the flesh. I don't want to hear it. I get that. But again, we're talking about a whole other level over here where they're actively fighting against God and His children. Their heart was darkened where no light can come in. Look at verse 22. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. I love this verse. It often reminds me of these, uh, these uh, college professors. Oh, you're a professor, huh? What, are you professing yourself wise? Oh, you say there is no God? Oh, doesn't the Bible tell us that the fool has said in his heart there's no God? Well, there you go, professor, right? Professor fool. Uh, verse 23. And change. Now, here's where they have the truth. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Right now, there's a whole naturalistic Wiccan movement today. I think God is in nature. Well, He is. He's the God of nature. But God is not the bird. And if you carve a stone to look like a fish, that's not God, okay? God created the stone and God created the fish. Don't worship something that you've carved and call it your God. That's just foolishness. Verse 24, Wherefore, God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own body between themselves. Now this is a fascinating statement that God gave them up to a different level of perversion that they weren't capable of on their own. God gave up on them, in a sense, is what it's saying. He's trying to draw them to the truth because they're lost, but then they begin to go towards Satan and they're like, I don't want to hear God. I don't want to hear God. And he says, okay, I'm going to give up on you and let you go in that direction and see if that's really the fruit you want in your life. Notice he says, to uncleanness, the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. You begin doing physical things that just go against everything that God's created you for. God gave up, he says in verse 24. You can underline that. Verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. 
I mean, we're talking about people worshiping people. Oh, I worship you. You're my, you're my lover, right? Or worshiping other animals and saying, oh, well, God made the animals like the Native American Indians. Now listen, uh, you know, I know that today this may not be politically correct or popular, but you understand that the Native American Indians were savage. They were brutal. They were abusers. They hurt a lot of innocent people. I'm not justifying, you know, what the government slaughtered them or put fleas in the blanket or any of that. You know, I'm not, I'm not revising history either, but I want to remind you that they were a wicked nation that God used the nation to judge. You understand when Jerusalem, when they became so vile and filthy and wicked that God called them Sodom and Gomorrah, He says, I'm going to send Egypt to judge you and I'm going to send Babylon to judge you and I'm going to let the Philistines in there and they're going to judge you. Over and over and over, God lets a more wicked nation come in and judge one. The savages were very brutal. They worshiped nature. Yeah, well, they did some very perverse things. They were savage. Verse 26, I want you to see this. He says, for this cause, right? Why? Because they changed the truth. For this cause, God gave them up into vile affections. Now, that's a very disgusting word. Vile, hurtful, putrid. That's what they have a, an affection for, a love for the disgusting. For this cause, God gave them up to something that's not normal. Look what it says. God gave them up unto vile affections for even their women to change the natural use into that which is against nature. And now I know it's not popular. You've got this LGBTQ, RSI, HIVQ, whatever movement, right? And what are they doing? Well, they're going against nature. It's not just nature they're going against. In their heart, they're going against God. And the result is they're after the children. Most of them have been abused as a child, and that's the result is then they got recu recruited when they were innocent and lost, and somebody came and hurt them and made them into one of them, and to the point they started hurting others. This is how Satan works. He wants to take a son of the devil and come attack, attack an innocent child and pervert them and convert them while they're young and, and simple to beguile that unstable soul. Now listen, there are children that have been hurt that the power of God is the Gospel of Christ. And the only way that they can find victory in their hurt life is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And let the Holy Spirit move in and begin to heal them. There are children that have been hurt and abused that can be saved, that need to hear the Gospel. That, I mean, this is how we break them free. It's through the power of God, which is the Gospel of Christ. But this warning in verse 26, what they're doing is against nature. It's not normal. Verse 27, And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. What does that mean? Well, men with men, they're doing that which doesn't seem right, right? and receiving... So they get this payback in themselves, in their flesh, that recompense, that's that payback, of their error, of their sins, which was meat. Meat means fitting. Fitting. Where did AIDS come from? Well, doing things you're not supposed to do that go against nature. Where did syphilis come from? Well, doing things against God's law and against nature. You do things over, and all of a sudden, something happens inside of your body, your body that has a certain system that's designed to do certain things a certain way. Let me tell you something. If you reverse the plumbing, and you go to the drinking fountain, and sewage comes out, you know what that's going to do to your body? Oh man, it'll destroy you. You'll get sick. You'll have a disease. You'll have an infection. Well, this is exactly what it's talking about. They've reversed things. They're, they're all messed up. Verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, see, here's the key. That's who this person is. They don't want to remember God. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Hold your place here and go to Jeremiah 6. Uh, I, I, there's a often mentioned the, the law of first mention in the Bible. I, I believe your Bible is a dictionary. Let's go to the first time it mentions the word reprobate so we understand what it's talking about. I'll remind you again, we're talking about 
the power of God, which is in the gospel. And this is contrasted against the wrath of God that comes on those that reject God and reject God to the point where God says, I'm done with you. I'm giving up on you. I'm giving you over to do these weird things that you want to do. It's not normal. It's not natural. It goes against nature. It goes against God. And you don't even want to remember me? Fine. You can grow your own disease in your flesh for rejecting my way. You're in Rome and Jeremiah 6. Look at the very end, the last verse, verse number 30. It says, Reprobate silver shall men call them because the Lord hath rejected them. The definition of the word reprobate is reject. What it's talking about when you mine silver, you dig it up, you have a, a chunk of silver, you put it in the furnace of fire, and at the top is called the dross. It separates the pure silver from the dross. The dross is the trash, the refuse, or the reject. And you scoop it off, and you throw it away. And God says, I'm calling you reprobate, I'm calling you a reject. Now this is a strong word. We just read, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. I have to keep laying this foundation. This is somebody that Jesus died for and they would not become saved. They weren't content with just being lost. They ran to the devil. Now, I want to define in Jeremiah 6 in context. Take a, back, take a step back to verse 15. Let's understand who we're talking about. Jeremiah 6, verse 15. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. We're dealing with somebody that's puffed up with pride. It tells us in Ezekiel that the sin of Sodom was pride. It started with pride. And boy, isn't that the movement today that we see? Yeah. This pride movement. They're not just content with being your equal. Oh, no, no, no. They want special rights. They want better rights. They want it, if you don't call them what you, you're supposed to call them, you're going to get locked up. If you don't love them, then you're, you're breaking the law. I mean, they don't want equal rights. They want special rights. They want to be above you. They want you to bow down to them is what they want. Were they ashamed when they committed these lewd acts in public? Oh, no, no. Over here in Jacksonville, uh, in Avondale, this, they, I mean, adult men dressing as women and putting on makeup and reading perverted stories to children and our government is sponsoring it. We've got a problem in America. We've got a problem in Jacksonville. We've got a problem in the churches because nobody's preaching about it. They just pretend, well, you know, they'll talk about it in the pews. But will they talk about it in the pulpit? Look what he says in verse 16. Thus saith the Lord... Stand ye in the old ways, in the ways, all right, and ask and see. I'm sorry, let me start over. Verse 16 Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths. What's he saying? Go back to the way we used to do it. Take a stand, look around, ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. Can you imagine running into somebody and they start telling you, man, I've got this problem in my flesh and I've got this problem in my life and I've got this financial problem. Problem after problem. It's almost like God is cursing me. You're like, hey man, you need to go to the old path and look for the old ways. What's the good way? You need to come to church and you need to get your life right for God. And they're like, well, I'm not interested in that. I just want the, the, the easy button. Is that what they call it? I want to flip a switch and everything goes good for me. We need the old paths, the good ways. Verse 17, he says, Also I set watchmen over you, saying, Hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, We will not hearken. That's, the trumpet was the judgment. Like, hey, the enemy's coming! Right? And here he's saying, I gave you preachers to warn you, and you didn't listen. 
Verse 18, Therefore, hear ye nations, and know, O congregation, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened unto my words, nor to my law, but rejected it. Now wait a minute. What kind of person are we talking about? Well, he calls them a reprobate. He says, they wouldn't listen to my word. They won't listen to my law. They've rejected my law. So when you get to verse 30, of these people, he says, reprobate silver shall men call them because the Lord hath rejected them. Here's the fact. If you reject this, and you reject this, and you reject this, there's coming a point where God's going to say, you know what? I I'm going to reject you now. I've given you a chance. I've given you a chance. I've given you a chance. And you don't want to hear from me? Why should I help you? Go back to Romans 1. Proverbs gives us a similar illustration that one day they will call and they, he just won't hear because they won't call out of a pure heart. Sometimes people call and they don't mean it. They say, oh, just God fix this. And it's like God saying, hey, this is a blessing to get your attention to believe on me. There are many people that reject the gospel and reject the gospel and reject the gospel and then one day they actually get saved and there are others that reject the gospel and they reject god and they reject his word and they hate his law and they want anything perverse and nothing normal and eventually god rejects them and they're still alive jesus said in matthew 23 when speaking to the pharisees he said "Ye shall have the greater damnation you understand, there's different levels in hell. And those Pharisees that were perverting the truth and hurting the simple and stealing from people, Jesus said, oh, you've got a, you've got a hotter hell coming, buddy, for converting people through their false gospel. You know, Hebrews 11 is a contrast to that. It tells us that there were some that laid down their lives and they'll have a better resurrection. You know, there's different levels in heaven, too. It's an honorable thing to be a doorkeeper, but you know God has some big jobs in eternity. I don't know what all they are. I don't think I could even understand them. But I know that. I believe it. I see it. And I'd like to achieve something. Yeah. I'd like to work for God while there's time. I'd like to die to myself and esteem others better than me and work for Christ while there's time and preach the Gospel and save souls. And listen, I mean... <laughs> We, you need to go out as a family preaching the Gospel. You need to go out as a young couple and preach the Gospel. You need to go out as an individual and preach the Gospel. You need to empower yourself with the Scriptures. This is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. And all, sometimes all you have to do is just start a little conversation. I try to do it every time I make a purchase. Boop! Oh, does this have the chip? <laughs> Boop! You know, one day they want to put a chip in us. And I gauge a response from the person on the other side. Oh, not me! Boy, they can cut my head off. You know, I've heard a lot of that. These days, I'm hearing people say, Oh, that'd be nice. That'd be real convenient. I wouldn't have to carry my wallet or phone or nothing. I'm thinking, Whoa! Hey, man, you don't know your Bible. Why? Well, they haven't heard it. How should they hear? How should they hear? Except we send preachers. Right. Romans 10 is so important. It ties in with Romans 1. He says in verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. That's a rejected mind. Their mind is done. To do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness. This is quite a list. Now I want you to understand before I read it. This is not saying that every reprobate does all of these things. He's given you a bucket list of some of the things that you're going to find on this type of a psychopath or reject or seared conscience individual. There are descriptions in the Old Testament as far as like child molesters and cannibals and perverts. Like, like there's descriptions all throughout the Bible of what the children of the devil do. They were throwing their babies into the fire. Can you visualize that? I don't even, I don't, it, it feels wrong for me to ask you to visualize that, having babies. Man, the first baby I caught, it was like, I mean, I started tearing up like a baby. I was like, I'm, I'm responsible for a life. This is a big deal. And they take these babies, throw them into an open fire, 
to serve their God, to get a blessing from a false god? The children of the devil have been around for a while by different names. And they want to destroy life. What does it say of Satan himself? It says, the thief cometh, but not for to, to help me out, what you say, to, to steal, to kill, and to destroy? Right? He wants to smite the shepherd and scatter the sheep. That's the devil's plan. Look at uh, verse 29. I want to read a couple of these. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication at the top of the list. And listen, Christian, you're saved. And you can commit fornication. Don't do it because you're going to look like somebody that's living for the devil. That's the fruit we expect from a child of the devil. Not from a child of God. You have the power of God over that. He's given you the Holy Spirit of God to resist temptation. We ought not to be given to fornication. Look, he goes on. He says wickedness. Covetousness. Now that covers a lot. Covetousness is idolatry. That's lusting after something that's not yours. Wanting something that God doesn't want you to have. Look, if a Ferrari goes by and you say, ooh, if I only had that, boy, I'd really be set. That's wrong. God doesn't want you that. I mean, if, if I had a Ferrari, frankly, I'd just have to mail in my driver's license because they would take it soon enough. Right? <laughs> I'm, I'm glad my truck doesn't go that fast. Right? Uh, look, he says, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness. Now, something malicious is hurtful, hurting others. Full of envy. And you guys know the difference between envy and jealousy. I'm jealous over my wife. She's my wife. But you can't, being envious is wanting something that's not yours. It ties in with covetousness. He says, murder, debate. We shouldn't be caught up in debates. Deceit. Malignity, that's maligning others, saying things that aren't true. Whisperers, oh, there you go, starting rumors, right? Backbiters, same kind of thing. Oh, did you hear about them? Haters of God, this is key, verse 30. This is a key definition of a reprobate. This is somebody that does not want to retain God in their knowledge. They're haters of God. They don't want to be told no. They don't want to be given any instruction. They have an authority problem. If you remember our soul winning this morning, the Bible was the first one. What I say? Authority. Some people don't believe that there is any authority that can judge them. God forbid. Look, he says, haters of God, despiteful, proud. There it is, proud. Boasters. You guys know that's where the term cracker comes from. They're always cracking off at the mouth. That's a southern term. People think it means cracking of the whip. No, the cracker was somebody that was always cracking off at the mouth, saying, I've got this, and I've got that, and I'm better than you, and I'm faster than you, and I'm smarter than you, and I'm better looking than you. Right? That's a boaster. We have nothing to boast of. right? If God's given you a skill or a talent, you better humbly thank Him and serve Him with it, and then teach somebody else how to serve God with something similar. God can do without boasters. He says, inventors of evil things. And you say, no, wait a minute, Pastor Fanning, are you telling me that the guys that made the atom bomb were reprobates? Probably. I mean, who would come up with a device that has one purpose? It's to eradicate a bunch of life all at once. Somebody that hates God and hates life and hates purity and hates the innocent, they don't care if they kill a thousand babies. Inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, uh-oh. Now, didn't we just see in Proverbs 20 that even a child is known by his ways? Children, you listen to me on this. Miss Norma Jean, if I picked on you for just a second, and I did the other night, and I said, uh, Miss Norma Jean, how old are you? 83. 83. And how long have you been in this church? <laughs> 50 plus years? Now, I asked Miss Norma Jean, I said, because she's, I mean, she can get around. She doesn't have any problems. God's really blessed her. And I said, you must have been obedient to your parents because the Bible says, help me out, children. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Help me out. Who can quote the rest? That it may be well with thee. Go on. And that they may live long on the earth. 
Now this comes from Exodus 20, and we see it reiterated in Deuteronomy 5. When we have it in Ephesians chapter 6, it's bringing it full circle, and it says, do you want to live old and still be healthy? Then you better start right now as a child and obey your parents. And I asked her, I said, Miss Norma Jean, you must have obeyed your parents. She said, well, of course I did. You better believe it. I want to be able to get to an old and healthy age still moving around and have God's blessing on my life and I obeyed my parents as best as I could and I had moments where I didn't and God punished me and my parents punished me you know now listen but it's interesting that in the mix of all of these disgusting things that these people do we have this indicator of their heart while they were a child you know elsewhere it talks about that these they defile others it says cursed children <coughs> You, you think about this in Sodom and Gomorrah when we see it in Genesis chapter 19 with Sodom and Gomorrah it says that the men of the city both old and young and then it said they surrounded the house it says the men of the city it says both small and great you know what happens they hurt the little ones then the little ones become herders they become molesters it's a virus it's a spiritual virus. And disobeying parents is something that they're proud of. Verse 31, without understanding, covenant breakers, that means always breaking their word. They won't keep the truth. Without natural affection, you know what natural affection is when somebody sees a baby? And, oh, look at that baby. That's so sweet. Or they see a new couple get married and they're like, praise the Lord for that. Good for them. We should pray for them. We should help them. Natural affection, it feels good to see a family thriving and healthy. It, it, it feels good to see others when they're hurt to get back up. And I'm glad you're okay. Unnatural affection is kick them while they're down. And ha ha ha, look what happened to you. Right? I mean, it's, it's, it's the opposite of normal. They're without natural affection, it says. Implacable. You cannot placate them. You can never please them. They're never satisfied. You give them an inch, they want a mile. You give them a little bit of respect. Oh, no, they want more than respect. They want you to bow down to them. It says unmerciful. They'll show no mercy. Verse 32, this is it and we're done. Look at it. He says, who knowing the judgment of God. These people know the judgment of God. What God has said will happen here and what will happen there when they go to hell. They know the judgment of God. It says that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. This is bizarre. They know that God says, I deserve to die with, for what I'm doing, and they do it anyway, and they love to watch other people do these sins unto death. This is a very bizarre culture, and unfortunately, it's becoming mainstream in America. They go against nature. They go against God. They go against the children. They go against everything that's normal. They're psychopathic. And I, you know, I'll spare the details, but most of you adults already know many of these mass murderers that have been caught that were cannibals, they were sodomites. They were hurting the simple and the innocent. There's some really bizarre things that happen in this world. And I remind you, the title of my sermon was this, or the concept is this, the power of God versus the wrath of God. Why should the power of God motivate us to preach the gospel? Because sometimes maybe you see their evil works and you don't know which one it is. But one of them can be saved. One of them may never be saved and that's their choice. That's on them. But it's my job to open my mouth and preach the gospel. And we live in such a time now where, it's, where the, the lines are so blurred. God is not the author of confusion, right? Amen? But what they want is everybody to be confused. Ooh, is it a guy or a girl? Is that a... I, 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 I don't know what I'm looking at. That's confusion, right? Now listen, with things like Disney movies, and, and I mean, Disney is just 
one of many. Okay, not this isn't just picking on Disney, but there's plenty there. All right, he was a wizard. He cast spells. He's part of a satanic secret society. Mickey was a wizard. That was how they started, right? That's Satanism. The Bible says a wizard should be put to death. Well, their agenda is to convert your children into children of the devil. That's their goal. But it's not just Disney because you could say, no Disney and we're safe. No, be careful because you give your child a phone and it's like, well, I have this YouTube star that I watch or this Instagram or whatever, whatever the next greatest social media thing is, it's there. The people are getting a following. They're doing evil and everybody's enjoying watching them. And they're, they're following the multitude to do evil and they're persuading them not to go toward Christ, but away from Christ and toward the devil. And th there's a whole generation being raised right now I saw this thing that they're, they're teaching 11 year olds in public school things that probably shouldn't even happen in a normal marriage. And they're giving them descriptions and reading stories and showing them. I mean, it's just unbelievable what's happening. They're defiling the minds of the simple. There is a war for souls. And if they can get them while they're young, then they'll be rejected of God ultimately because they won't believe the truth. So what do we do? Romans 16, look, he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It's power. I want God's power and it comes through the gospel. I want to be known for honoring God and letting my life live the power of God, which is the gospel. Jesus Christ can shine through me when I preach the gospel. That's what we have to do. Pulling them out of the fire. Pulling them out of the fire. Hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. So what do we have to do? Open our mouth boldly and preach the gospel. He says in verse 17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. We can save their souls and there are some that are confused that are in the middle. They're not a reprobate. They're not a hater of God. They're not a child of God. But if you ask them, you say, are you LGBTQ friendly? They might say, yes, I think so. They might, they're confused. They might say something that's wrong because they've been taught wrong. And I say we still preach the Gospel to them because that's the power of God. Don't worry about how strong Satan's power is. Don't worry about the influence of the reprobate. You worry about the power of God and you preach the Gospel to the lost and you pull them out of the fire from faith to faith. They say, I'm confused and I think this and I think that. And you say, well, that's good for you, but let me tell you the truth. Let me show you what God says. And it's a point unto man wants to die. And after this, the judgment. Let me give you the truth. Verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Those that know the truth and reject it, they have hell to pay. Those that believe the power of God, which is the Gospel of Christ, there's nothing they can do to go to hell. But instead of passing your time here looking and living like the lost world, won't you be a soul winner? Won't you preach with the power of God, which is the gospel of Christ? That's what we've been called to. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You so much for Your Word. Lord, thank You for Romans 1. It gives us a clear instruction that anybody can be saved by believing on You. Lord, thank You for dying for everyone's sins. Lord, I pray that You would help me to tell others more for Your glory. Lord, I pray that You would help us to pull some of these children out of this wicked generation that are confused by Disney and social media. Lord, I pray that You would help us to pull them out and get them in church and get them in the Word. Get them saved, Lord, by the Gospel, which is the power. Lord, we love You so much. We thank You for Your promises. Lord, fill us with Your Holy Spirit as we worship You now. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.